What is so cool about a slug? Do you want to find out how to find spiders in the dark? Well, sit back and relax and listen to this show about how to get your child involved with nature with naturalist Susie Spickle. Susie Spickle is a naturalist at the Harris Center for Conservation Education in Hancock, New Hampshire. If you ask her what her favorite animal is, she will not be able to choose. She spent her entire life loving animals, especially the ones that have quote unquote bad reputations, like the petite but venomous short-tailed shrew and the most famously stinky striped skunk. In her three-decade-long career, Susie has helped people of all ages fall in love with and connect with the natural world. From going on midnight owling expeditions and early morning bird walks to catching frogs and following bear tracks on snowshoes, she spends most of her work days outside in search of animals and their signs. She's also known by some as the Princess of Poop. She has an award-worthy scat collection that has been the talk of her small town when it was once showcased at the town library. And when she isn't at work, leading people in all ages through nature walks or in her office sorting through her scat collection, she spends time writing about nature and can be found outside with her three children and two dogs having their own adventures. Her new book is what we are going to be talking about. It is called The Animal Adventurer's Guide, How to Prowl for an Owl, Make Snail Slime, and Catch a Frog Barehanded, 50 Activities to Get Wild with Animals. And you're going to hear her advice of how to instill this love in your child of nature, animals, and the planet. So welcome to the show. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, this is Mary Jo Tinlin with Teaching Your Toddler. Today, we have an awesome guest. Her name is Susie Spickle. Susie, tell us a little bit about yourself first, and then we'll talk about your book. Yeah, thanks, Mary Jo. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited about about sharing my book and my thoughts on getting kids outside, kids of all ages. And yeah, I'm a naturalist at a place called the Harris Center for Conservation Education. I've been there for about 30 years. And I work with kids of all ages, starting from babies in backpacks, all the way, actually, all the way through lifespan, people who are in hospice and memory care. So really a whole lifespan of getting outside or just connecting to the natural world. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's, uh, that is great. And and it's such a, uh, such an important thing. I know, you know, kids, especially like, I don't know, we were at the having lunch the other day and these two kids, all they had was their iPad and the, the parents were watching football. And it's like, how do we extract them from that and get them outside? How can we lure them out there? Cause I know you have some exciting tips to about talk about that. Yeah, I know the screen is such a powerful kind of hypnotizer and it makes us stay inside and and we're glued to this reality that's happening on this small screen and for kids in particular it it isn't very healthy for them in the sense that there isn't a lot of hands-on parts it's it they're not experiencing something that's really happening out there Um, so i think the best thing that we can do is model for our kids and put down our own phones and our own devices (laughs) and get outside (laughs) okay (laughs) listen to that parents that we gotta we gotta walk the walk I know a lot of times people are like, well, what, what, how can we get our kids outside? And and it's, I'm always about families getting outside. And I think that's really where exciting things happen. And that's where connections are really formed. So I'm all about putting down my own phone and getting outside with my own kids. And um, I think that's great. And then once kids get used to it, I think they'll find that it's really exciting. It's unpredictable. There's loose parts. It's free. Um, it's kind of, you're not contained to a space you can use your body really physically so I just think that once we kind of model how to do it they'll get it absolutely and so the book is filled with ideas for doing exactly that so tell us a little bit about the book what your inspiration was maybe if you want to talk about the writing of it or whatever but love to hear your thoughts on that Sure, yeah. The book, The Animal Adventurer's Guide, How to Prowl for an Owl, Make Snail Slime, and Catch a Frog Barehanded, really came out of my many, many years of being a naturalist and an environmental educator. And I just thought I wanted to write something that gave the power to families, that gave it to the kids, kind of my bag of tricks. I just emptied out my bag of tricks, what I know really works for families, for kids, what really is engaging. It's all around animals. I think that um, 
as, as human animals, we are really, really curious about other animals and kids in particular. It's a real no brainer. They want to know, they even want to be the animals that they kind of fall in love with. And so I just put down my best, my goal. I put it all in the book and I'm hoping a lot of people find it and get outside with their families and get their kids excited about connecting to the natural world. And I will say that behind it all, I think that that's really the only way to make a difference. Well, it's not the only way, but it's a really important way to make a difference um, in this world in terms of our natural world and the environment. If kids don't have those experiences, if they're not connected to the natural world, then why would they care about it as an adult? And we need every single person, all the kids who are growing up, we need everybody on board to really care about it the earth. We, we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I I see that you described yourself or you've been described as an animal adventurer, or you, you trying to inspire animal adventurers. Um, I also see that you really like animals that have a quote unquote bad reputation. So tell us about that. Yeah, I love the I love the naughty animals, the animals that <laughs> you know that um, kind of have a bad reputation. I live in New England, and an animal that has a really bad reputation here is the Fisher. Some people call it the Fisher cat, and I love to unpack the myths behind the Fisher and kind of help people see that the Fisher's just really good at its job. It's a fabulous predator, and in our world, if somebody's really good at their job, we we don't make them bad or make them evil, we kind of celebrate them. So I would like us to celebrate the animals that are just very successful. I love animals too, that are kind of gross. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's kind of crazy, but I'm a big fan of slugs, um, which are very slimy and gooey, but I just think they're so fascinating. And um, they're a total uh, perfect animal for young kids. You know, they can pick them up. It's, it's messy, but they can pick them up. They can look at they're them. Harmless, yep. They're harmless. Mm -hmm. They have no teeth. Yeah, they're slimy, <laughs> but I mean, they can have an encounter with an animal like a slug and, and it's, it's really cool to watch them and see them when their little eye stalks come up at the top of their head. <laughs> so I, I, I like the gooey, gross animals and the animals that are kind of naughty in our world. I like that you, I, I can come to terms better with a slug. When you look at it like that, that's much better because I do not like slugs. But I, I, side note, is is a fisher the same as a nutria? No, um, a fisher is in the weasel family. Okay. It's, it's like related to an otter or a little weasel mm -hmm. or a mink. And I think a nutria is in the, in the rodent family. Rodents. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Okay, perfect. Uh, I just was asking or wondering yeah. about that. So some of the things that I saw, you know, how do you spy on nocturnal animals? Oh yeah, I love spying on nocturnal animals. And I think it's so great to be able to go outside at night with your family and, and kind of have an adventure um, in the world of animals. That's when so many animals are active. And so what I like to do is put a little red light or, or a red cover over my flashlight. And a lot of times I just use red cellophane, which, you know, we're beginning to enter the season where red cellophane is very popular. So you put just red cellophane right over the regular lens and it turns your light red and animals can't really perceive the red light. So you can go out with your light and you can see it makes you feel safe, but the animals can't really see you. And it's a great time to see, you know, bats, moths, um, even um, sort of the big mammals. If you live in an area where there's deer, uh, you can see owls, things like that. So I just think going out at night is a great adventure. And really, if you even if you live in a city, you know, you want to make sure that you're going to a safe place outside at night. Um, so you have to just pay attention to where you are. But everything in my book, I hope can be done in all places. Original, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, I got my naturalist um, vibe on when I was growing up in a city. And I'm just a big fan of the city. So 
lots of nature there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I I lived in Colorado for a long time. I don't live there now. I live in Kansas, uh, which is a completely different ecosystems. But uh, we do have, I, I, I was asking someone the other day, I was like, what is our apex predator here? Because, you know, in Colorado, we have several um, that you do have to be careful of, like you were saying in the evening and and, and things like that. Just, uh, I, I don't, I don't know if I'd want to see my red flashlight flashing <laughs> on a, on a mountain lion or black bear, but yeah, I, I don't know if I'd want to see that either. But one thing <laughs> to just remember is that if you go out as a family, you're in a group, you're making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't recommend this for an individual if you live in a place where there's something mm -hmm. like a mountain lion mm -hmm. um, or black bears or, you know, brown bears or anything like that. But if you're in an area um, and you're going out with a group of people, you know, you and your kids, um, I think it's safe and you don't have to go very far. You can go right around your house. One other really cool thing about um, I like to do at night is um, go out with just my regular flashlight um, and not with the red lens over it. And um, you can look for eye shine. That's like, you know, when you're driving and you see the flash of an animal's eyes cross in front of you, it's the, mm -hmm. the light of your headlights catching the animals in the eye. Um, well, you can do that with a, just a regular flashlight and see some really amazing eyes. And a really cool thing is, believe it or not, is spiders. They often have like almost... Spiders have eye shine? Yeah, they have eye shine. And they have, and it can be like red. It can be like rubies. So, you know, oh we just gosh. go, we just go in the front of my house and in my tiny little lawn in my kind of suburban area. And we look at the lawn and there's all these like ruby red eyes shining. It's really magical. Wow. Okay. I'm glad I've never seen that, but that is a really cool <laughs> way to look at that. <laughs> See, it's me. I love all those weird things. I um, think I, I don't think I ever really grew up. I, I don't think I got past the age of 10. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just so in love with all that kind of nature stuff. Oh, that's, that is, uh, it's amazing. I love it. I love it. Okay. I've heard that you have a legendary scat collection. How would you <laughs> inspire someone to start a scat collection and what is scat? Yeah. Yes. So scat is just a word that naturalists use to describe animal droppings. Um, and I know that sounds really strange, but you know, it's such a great thing to be able to find scat and you can identify what animal left it behind, behind just by the shape of it or where it's located or the contents of it. And so um, I'm all about checking that out when I find it with a group of students or kids, you know, we look at it, you never, of course, you never want to pick it up barehanded. So I always have some plastic bags in my um, backpack and I put my hand in the plastic bag, just like if I was scooping up my own dog's waist. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then when I bring it back inside, whether it's a classroom or my own house, I put it out, I take it out of the bag and put it in newspaper. And then you fold up the newspaper, you let it dry for a couple of weeks, and then you can put it in a jar. A couple of things about the SCAT collection is, um, you know, it's such a great way to know if there's that animal in your own neighborhood. A lot of times you might not see its footprints, especially if you live in a place where there isn't snow or mud. Um, and you might not know who your neighbors are, but the scat will tell you. And not only will it tell you who your neighbors are, but it'll tell you what they've been eating. Mm. And just a word of caution, it used to be Back in the old days, when somebody would find scat, they'd break it open. But nowadays, we don't really break it open because we've learned that it can release kind of a bacteria that you can breathe in and that can make you ill. So that's mm. why I jar it up. Mm. And um, it's I do have a legendary scat collection that some people some people call me the princess of poop in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> nice. it's, it's been on display at our town library. Um, I use it all the time when I'm teaching and it embarrasses my own kids to no end. <laughs> I bet. What's the strangest thing you've ever found from scat or, or anything about a, an animal? Yeah. I mean, a really cool thing that I found was, um, back to Fisher, one of those animals that get, has that bad reputation. And one thing you always hear about Fisher is that they are one of the only predators of porcupine. So um, I actually found some scat that was Fisher scat that had porcupine quills in it. So I oh, feel wow. like proof right there, mm. you know, the scat doesn't lie. <laughs> oh my um, goodness. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. That's, that's I, amazing. I, just, I have to say too, um, 
that I have gotten some really nice Valentine gifts from from pre previous partners of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and one was uh, Bobcat Scat, which was just really thrilling for me. I know. And then <laughs> so another one had a friend um, smuggle back elephant scat uh, and gave it to me on Valentine's Day. So, oh my goodness. Forget the chocolate. I just want the scat. <laughs> That has got to be the most unique Valentine's gift I've ever heard of, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, we used to do when we would hike in Colorado. Um, it was a bingo kind of when you when we would see scat. If we said, "Oh, it's fresh" or whatever, that was like our family bingo of like, "Oh, there we go. We got yeah. we got some more," you know. And we would see sometimes bobcat, fox, um, certainly yeah. deer, moose, of course, and elk. Tons of stuff. That was cool. That's so cool. I mean, your kids, they probably still remember that. They probably still joke around about it. So, oh, and, oh and gosh, yeah. Yeah, they loved it, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Who does? Yeah, what absolutely. kid doesn't? It's, I was always, and, and maybe this is part of the book, but you know, something that I, I always notice is, is if you look around, you will see a lot of animals that maybe people don't notice, you know, a hawk on the, on the light pole or, um, you know, just, just little stuff like that, that, that people overlook and they, and you think, oh my gosh, you've got so much right here, right around you, even though you think you live in the suburbs or the city, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's actually really the point of my book. I, I wanted to call it everyday wildlife. Um, but you know, when you write a book that you don't really have a choice on what they call it. So <laughs> I do like the animal adventurers guide a ton. But I wanted the emphasis to be on everyday wild animals. And you have to think from a kid's perspective, mm -hmm. a caterpillar is just as exciting and just as wild as something like an eagle. And in fact, it might even be more appropriate. A kid can really see a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. They can watch it. They can get up close to it. Um, if they feel comfortable, they might even gently touch it. Um, whereas an eagle, you know, by the time a little person kind of gets their eyes on the eagle, it's gone and mm. it was just fleeting. That's exciting for maybe us as adults or as we get older. But for, for kids, I think starting with the little wild animals that are all around is really the right place. And and anybody with kids knows that mm -hmm. they get excited. A kid will get excited when they see a ladybug, you know, mm -hmm. something as common as that, mm -hmm. even if it's in your house and you're not that excited about it, they <laughs> are. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I live now in Kansas where we do have fireflies. We didn't have them in Colorado, but I mean, that's one of the first things that I remember doing as a kid outside is catching fireflies and putting them in a jar and keeping them for a day to look at them, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I think that that's really important. And, you know, I, I will say my book is a lot about interacting with wildlife appropriately and sensitively and compassionately. Um, and I understand some people might not feel that that's a comfortable thing, but I think as a, as a teacher, as a person that works with young kids, they they need to have those experiences maybe where they gently hold a frog for a moment or mm -hmm. pick up a salamander or catch a firefly um, because those are the things that make it really real to them mm -hmm. it goes right in their heart and it gives them something they draw back on as an adult. They have good memory about it. If we made the natural world a place where they couldn't touch anything, it would be like a museum. Mm -hmm. And I think there would be less of a connection. Mm -hmm. So I, I do know I, I get a little pushback on that from people about all my touching of wildlife, but I just think it's really important. Yeah. And it's their house too, right? Like we, their front yard, our front yard is also their house, right? Right. We, um, we've made the mistake one time, just a word of warning is when my son was little, he was a toddler and, uh, we, we saw a baby bunny, um, and we were like, I'll oh, get the bunny. He's like two years old. And we thought there's no way. And he came back with the little bunny. We were like, Oh my gosh, we were kidding around, but like, don't have him go do that. We should have. Oh, I don't know. We weren't even thinking because we, we were like, how will you catch a bunny? He's two years old. And he did. <laughs> Right. I mean, kids are remarkable. I, I was once on a field trip um, and we were ponding. I was with third graders. That means we were collecting muck and looking at all the creatures. And and um, I look over and this boy's got his net, but he's 
holding a weasel. Oh. He caught a weasel oh, and the wow. weasel's like trying to bite him. And I <laughs> things you just think you'd never say on a field trip. I'm like, hi, put the weasel down. <laughs> so, you know, kids and wildlife are unpredictable in some ways and you mm. can't always control the outcome. So it is good to make sure that when you're exploring outside, you have some good, clear boundaries and mm -hmm. conversation about what what's um what's right to touch and what's maybe not right to touch mm -hmm. and you know when we learn we we kind of experience things yes absolutely and just how exciting that a kid would that you would have that conversation so encourage people to to get out there and have that conversation um uh, one last question i want to ask before i have you tell us where to find everything um i i saw in in the notes about building a wildlife blind so that basically you're camouflaging yourself so that you can watch. How do you do that? Like, and, oh, and what does that look like for people? It's so fun. It's so fun. I had just such a great experience as a young kid or in behind a bird blind. As I mentioned, I grew up in Brooklyn and my parents were school teachers. So we never had a lot of money and they were always like taking us to free things, you know? So one of the free things we did was we went to Jamaica Bay wildlife refuge, which is in Queens and it looks it's there's a big wetland but it looks out on the skyline of Manhattan it's just oh, like wow. st stunning but incredible wildlife and there there was a snowy owl that had come to visit in the winter and we waited in line behind, and finally I got up to the blind which is just sort of camouflaged it's designed to kind of camouflage and there's a little slit and you can look through it and uh, that's how I got to see my first snowy owl. Mm. And, and since then, I've been a real fan of blinds. And, and it's also great. Kids love to build forts. Mm -hmm. As many of us know, they, if you said, we're going to go outside, we're going to build forts, you know, every kid is going to be super excited about it. So in a way, this is just one wall of a fort. It's just an, uh, kind of a area where you pile up sticks mm -hmm. um, or whatever kind of um, debris you have in your area. Corn stalks work well, sticks work well, boughs of trees work really well. And you just kind of pile it up so that you can lay down or sort of sit behind it. And you want to leave it so it, it has some spaces so that you can look right through it. And it just creates sort of a, a visual block for the animals. Mm -hmm. And it's just a really fabulous way to be very quiet and watch different wildlife come in. And you feel like you're wearing an invisibility cloak. Mm. You know, you're behind this so kind of wall of natural items and they don't really see you. So wow. it's a great, it's, a, it's very fun. Oh my goodness. I hope people will try that. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. Tell us uh, where to find your book and where to find out more about you. Sure. Yeah, you can find my book at Amazon, of course. Um, I would love it if you asked your independent bookstores to get it too, and your library and your schools. So you can um, you can work on that. That would be wonderful. And you can find out more about me and my and writing and events that I do at my website at www.suzyspickle. That's all one word. Dot com. And um, I'm sure you'll put how to spell my name in the notes. Yes, absolutely. We will, we will put links in the, <laughs> in the show you. notes for sure. So people can find you yeah. again. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I hope people have some really good inspiration to get outside and um, hang out with the animals with their, with their little ones. Yeah. I was going to say too, you can follow me on Instagram oh, and you can it's just Susie Spickle uh, at my Instagram. If you um, make any bird blinds or go out on a night walk with your family, you can just send it to me, post it, Ooh. hashtag it, whatever you want. I've been using hashtag and animal adventurer. Animal so, adventurer. Okay. Yeah, I'll we'll, look forward we'll, we'll to make sure that. that's in there too. Thanks, Perfect. Thank you. Have a great gotcha. day. You too. Take care. <laughs> Bye. This has been the Teaching Your Toddler podcast with Mary Jo Tinlin. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you'll find us on our website at teachingyourtoddler.com, as well as on Facebook at Teaching Your Toddler, on Instagram, and on Twitter at Teaching Toddler. So join us again, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you so much.